the CR firm and the Plant and Food Research Limited are collaborating to develop suitable products, prototype products from sargassum for commercial use, for safe and total utilization of sargassum biomass, possibly as liquid fertilizer and compost to bolster agriculture. This seminar will build awareness and understanding of the work done to date in the Caribbean to mitigate the impacts of sargassum inundations on Caribbean countries through the development of sustainable and innovative value chains while strengthening partnerships and building synergies with other institutions and initiatives to address the problem. We hope it will also enhance our efforts to maximize opportunities that exist to strengthen the region's oceans economies. There is a saying, One's man, one, one man's waste is, an, is another man's treasure. And we hope through dialogue, networking, technology transfer, and close collaboration with international and regional partners and the private sector to change an abundance of waste into meaningful treasure for our people. In this regard, this morning, we have a range of expert speakers here to discuss this very important topic and most importantly, identify viable solutions to the problem. Uh, their bios are, are, are on the screen and it's a bit much to read, so I will just go through um, the, the presenters and the topics that they'll be presenting on, and I will ask them to briefly introduce themselves when they make their presentation. So uh, one of our speakers, the first speaker this morning is Mr. Milton Horton. He is the executive director of the CRFM, which is the Caribbean Regional Fisheries Mechanism, and he will be addressing um, impacts of sargassum inundations on the fisheries sector of CRFM member states through the development of sustainable value chains. We also have Dr. Bruce Searle, Crop Physiology Team Leader from the New Zealand Institute of Plant and Food Research Limited, and he will be speaking on innovation and technologies for the safe and total use of sargassum biomass to bolster Caribbean agribusiness. Mr. Devon Gardner, Head of Technical Programs, Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, will be looking at opportunities and challenges for generating renewable energy from sargassum. Mr. Joshua Ford, founder and CEO of Red Diamond of Barbados Compost Inc., will be discussing Red Diamond's experience in converting sargassum to plant tonic and treatment. And Mr. Lench Frevrier, Senior Technical Specialist, Agriculture Sector, OECS Commission, will be, dis will be discussing the OECS sargassum journey to advance the value chain devel development. So without further ado, let me introduce Mr. Milton Horton to make his presentation, after which uh, all the presenters having made their presentation, we will entertain questions to the panel. Thank you. As you are all aware, we are all aware because we have experienced the problem associated with sargassum in some fashion, ways, or form. <laughs> Since 2011, we have been experiencing these massive, massive blooms of sargassum and accumulation of sargassum seaweed in our coastal waters and on our beaches. And uh, it has been causing quite a lot of problems for us, socioeconomic problem, because it impacts on our critical tourism sector. When the beaches and coastal waters are filled with sargassum, it's not conducive for uh, our visitors um, to use the beaches or indeed enjoy the beautiful, warm Caribbean seawater. <laughs> And so, and so it's a problem. It has also been impacting on the fisheries sector. And um, in the in latter part of 2011, early 2012, there was a huge outcry from our fishers across the region when they were first impacted by, by the sargassum. And many of them were just not able to operate. So you know, in the early, early periods, um, many of the fishers um, basically uh, were not able to go, go to conduct their fishing activities. <coughs> so let me just um, touch on some of the key reasons um, why we are having this problem, and also to make the point that this is probably going to be with us for a while. <laughs> um, 
it's related to climate change, according that's 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 the emerging scientific consensus. The warming water and the climate change is contributing to this. But there is also nutrification of the um, oceans, significant runoff of uh, fertilizers carried into the ocean by the river systems, and especially when you have floods and so on, you have a lot of uh, fresh water with all the um, fertilizers entering into the oceans. <laughs> and this is a pollution, a pollutant, uh, or, or, the, or, the, or the fertilizers, because they are different types. You know, it is polluting the environment, it is enriching the environment, and it is contributing to blooms of the sargassum. Um, but also, you know, upwelling along the African coast, um, where nutrient is brought up from the deep oceans, brought up to the surface, and it is um, contributing to the nutrification. Also contributing to the nutrification is the Sahara dust. Um, increasing Sahara dust clouds carry nutrients. It, it's deposited in the water. <coughs> um, and then ocean circulation, you know, associated with climate change. We're seeing significant changes in ocean circulation, and that's a big concern generally with um, um, uh, climate change. But you have what is now called the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt, <laughs> which is a current system that is basically moving sargassum right across the Atlantic, a 5,000-mile uh, 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 belt that is transporting sargassum. Um, and, and we're having inundation on the African coast. At the same time, we're having the inundation in the Caribbean. So it's an Atlantic-wide um, phenomenon, and, it, and, and it's quite massive. And you see in the picture there, um, the, well, well, I, well, in the two pictures at the bottom, you see the, the, the belt, and you see um, a fishing, fishing boat sitting on top of um, some um, sargassum there. <coughs> All right, um, this, this um, picture just shows the level of inundation in um, the month of August, starting from 2011 through to uh, the present, August of 2023. And you see the, the, uh, the, the images of Sargassum. So, you know, it has varied over the years, and it, and it does vary from year to year. Uh, um, but overall, what we're witnessing is an increasing, is an increasing trend in the blooms, the amount that is blooming in the region. So in 2011, the total bloom was estimated at 2 million metric tons. 2018, it was 20 uh, million metric tons. In, 20, in 2022, I think it was 22 uh, million metric tons. So, so, so we are clearly seeing an increasing trend, and that's the main message I want to um, give from this. <coughs> Now, one of the good things is that since the sargassum started blooming and impacting us, um, several organizations have been looking at this and trying to figure out what is going on and understanding what is going on. And I must say that the, 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 the body of literature on sargassum has expanded significantly. So today, we know much more <laughs> and we have much better understanding of sargassum than we did in the past. The, the, the important thing is that sargassum is a natural marine resource. Just like fish, shellfish, we have five to 600 different species of marine algae available to us. And each of them, each has a role in the marine ecosystem. Sargassum is a natural uh, uh, marine uh, living resource, and it can be used uh, beneficially and it plays a role. So, so sargassum is actually an important ecosystem. It supports important uh, marine life, and certain fish and marine organisms are dependent on sargassum. There's the sargassum sea, which you did have seen in the earlier picture. Um, you know, that has been um, a very important ecosystem. So, you know, we need to recognize that. But the problem is when the sargassum is blooming uh, in this phenomenal manner and uh, impacting uh, the, 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 the coastal ecosystem, uh, the beaches, and uh, our, our, our um, traditional fisheries. You know, that is the problem. <coughs> 
Okay, um, moving on, I want to now touch on some of the um, impacts and uh, challenges for Sargassum. So um, Sargassum, really, overall, the impact on the fishery sector um, has been negative. It entangles fishing gear. It's difficult for fishermen to operate. It damages the fishing gear. Get into the boat engines and you know damage their 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 engine. The gears get clogged and so on. Um, fishing harbors sometimes are clogged and fishers cannot leave <laughs> their beaches or get through the mass of sargassum um, that stretches across their beaches or their harbors, and so it impedes access to sea. And so we have seen a decreased landing in important uh, 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 species, not because the, the populations are declining, but um, some of the fish, they will stay away from the sargassum. So when you have mass of sargassum in the, in, the, in the coastal waters, the fish will perhaps be further out you know, and, and in different areas and so on. So for example, the flying fish fishery of Barbados has been very neg negatively uh, impacted, significant decline in production um, with the presence of um, uh, sargassum. But it's also altering the composition uh, and availability of um, fish uh, for harvesting. We have seen changes in the composition. So one thing that we notice, and, and I mentioned it's an important ecosystem, so young fish, young dolphin fish, for example, juveniles, they're associated with the sargassum. They like the sargassum. They like to hang around the sargassum. And uh, the big ones, the large adults, um, they don't like it, so they're not there. And uh, what, what was occurring initially is that um, the, the fishers who used to target the dolphin fish, the adult do dolphin fish, um, they weren't finding any of them. And so they were taking the juveniles. But of course, that can be dangerous. If you start hammering those juveniles and preventing uh, the, them to grow to adulthood where they can spawn, um, in future years, you could have serious problems. Now, um, <coughs> the CRFM Ministerial Council came up with, a, with a, a minimum harvest size for the dolphin fish to protect uh, the population. I know some countries uh, you know, have implemented and are following um, those uh, uh, measures to protect the dolphin fish. But also we have seen other species um, um, increase in uh, abundance in the coastal water, the amberjack, for example. Uh, and um, you know, fishers have been able to diversify and uh, harvest some species that they weren't able to. And fishers have adapted uh, you know, they, to, to protect their gears and protect their equipment and found ways of getting around the problem. So initially there was a major disruption, but you know, I would say now fishers have uh, adapted and find ways of continuing their operation. Uh, but there's also increase in operational cost for the fishers. You know, in some t some time now they have to go further, different areas. They have to use more fuel. You know, they, it's it's more difficult moving through the uh, uh, So they have travel time and you know increase um, maintenance. Sargassum is actually very corrosive <laughs> um, to the fishing gear, to the boats, and so on. And you know, increase cost and and so on. Uh, and um, I mentioned already that the migration route of some species. Um, uh, um, would, would, would have been disrupted. But in looking at the fish, we have to look at it in a more comprehensive manner. So we need to look at the impact of sargassum on the marine ecosystems and habitats and species that are part of the ecosystem. And indeed, I mentioned uh, sargassum is an important habitat and food for certain marine species, um, turtles, certain fish, birds, etc., in the in the open ocean. It is in the coastal waters now where, where it causes the, the, the big problem. So it will smother and kill certain marine species. It will destroy coral reefs. You know, coral reefs need, need, need sunlight. You know, coral reefs, tri reefs thrive in, in um, uh, a clear blue water where they can get um, the sunlight to you know, carry out um, their biological function. So when you have this mat of seaweed covering the co coral reef, after a time, they are going to get weak and they will eventually die on top of the bleaching from the warm waters. So, you know, double whammy <laughs> and, uh, you know, and uh, other problems. Um, the, the, um, the, the sargassum, when it's in the coastal waters, eventually it will deteriorate. 
and it will die. When it, when it, when it uh, decays, it releases hydrogen sulfide gas, ammonia, uh, methane, uh, a whole range of, and, and you will recognize that uh, some of these are greenhouse gases. <laughs> um, and these gases will alter the water chemistry. The water will get more acidic. Um, it can cause oxy oxy oxygen depletion <laughs> and increase acidity and also more nutrient in the water. All these things are bad <laughs> and you know, uh, um, negatively impact the ecosystems and the life. And in some cases, oxygen levels are falling to, to, to levels below which the fish can survive. And so you have fish kills, <laughs> especially in sheltered bay, sheltered harbors. We have had um, fish kills from the, um, with the presence of the, the, the uh, sargassum on all, and all the um, toxic um, gases that they release and are dissolved in the water. Um, so, so it disrupts the ecological um, processes. It impacts on the ecosystem. It contaminates the beaches, coastal waters, um, uh, etc and um, it transports large amounts of nutrient from the open ocean to the coast. Um, so it affects the, the balance of um, life in the system. And all negative impacts, uh, if the ecosystem is degraded, the fish population that they support is also um, degraded. So um, um, quite um, significant. OK, the next thing I want to look at is the people, <laughs> because um, we're interested in the fish catches, uh, we're interested in the marine ecosystem, but we also have to look at the people and the fishers <laughs> and those who are living in the coastal communities and fishers that tend to live in the coastal community, the impact that sargassum is having on them. And in 2015, 2016, the um, French authorities uh, did a study and raised concern about the toxic gases and heavy metals that they found in sargassum in the, in, the, in the French islands. Um, and I can say there's a growing body of um, scientific evidence now confirming uh, the risks to people from the um, toxic gases that are released and also from the fact that sargassum has significant um, levels of um, heavy metals. Um, the sargassum, uh, as, a, as a marine algae, it has a high capacity to absorb and accumulate heavy metal from the seawater. And these include cadmium, arsenic, lead, mercury, and uh, including inorganic arsenic. Because you know you have different species of arsenic, but the inorganic one is the uh, most dangerous one, most toxic. And um, yeah, so heavy metals can accumulate in the body and become toxic and very harmful. They can damage the functioning of the brain, lungs, kidneys, liver, blood composition, and other organs. Real nasty stuff. Long-term exposure to heavy metal can lead to muscular and neurological degenerative processes. That looks like multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, muscular dystrophy, and even cancer. And uh, the sargassum um, seaweed, because of the chemical composition and these heavy metals, um, they can contaminate agricultural land, and if they get in the, uh, um, uh, the aquifers, um, groundwater, they can contaminate the groundwater. So, so all, all um, serious um, co concerns. <coughs> um, so what can we, what can we do um, with the sargassum? Um, it is indeed a very important and a complex uh, marine algae. It contains hundreds of elements and compounds. Turning to the uses now, um, sargassum, it's very complex, very versatile, and it has hundreds of um, elements and um, compounds. And therefore, it has the potential for valorization and use in many ways to benefit society. The, the impact on people, you know, I mentioned the heavy metal, but I also need to mention the, the, um, the toxic gas that is released, um, the hydro hydrogen sulfide gas and the ammonia in particular. Um, these gases are released upon decomposition when the, when the sargassum starts decaying. And once it beaches, uh, it starts decaying within, within 36, 48 hours. 
And the gases, according to the medical experts, again, a lot of the work here coming from our French colleagues, so I'm really, um, we're really grateful for um, the work that they have been doing, but increasingly, University of the West Indies and others in Mexico, Dominican Republic, all over, have been, you know, working on it. <coughs> but, they can, but, but it can cause severe pulm pulmonary, neurological, and cardiovascular damage. That is the gases. In a, we're not talking about the heavy metal, now the gases, <laughs> hydrogen sulfide, as well as skin rashes, nausea, headaches, respiratory irritation, imbalance in persons who are exposed to the gas. And I've been exposed to the gas. I've been in it, and I know it's, it's nasty stuff. It smells bad and, you know, bad. well, quickly develop <laughs> headaches and so on. So, you know, it's not good. Can trigger allergic reaction. And, and for people with respiratory problem, asthma attacks can affect mental health, well-being, and quality of life by creating unpleasant smell and sight on the beaches and prevent people from enjoying uh, the beaches and coastal, coastal, coastal uh, ecosystems that their residents you know, in our countries are used to and which really contribute to their well-being. So not only physical, but the psychological health can be impacted. So the heavy metals, and to a lesser extent, the toxic gases, they, they do pose a significant concern when we are handling and trying to use um, sargassum. But the important thing is that there are safe ways of using sargassum to create value-added products. So we just, and, uh, and the truth is, these heavy metals and these gases, you know, they're around. <laughs> um, they're part of the, the, the system. And once you know what they are and you know what you're dealing with, you can devise um, uh, uh, safe ways of dealing with them. And that's one of the key messages I want to uh, um, convey here. So if you hear nothing else, you realize you're, you should hear that sargassum, uh, um, it's, it's, they are a risk, but they are still important opportunities. So um, Yui, Surmese in particular, they have been doing a lot of work on the sargassum. And uh, they uh, prepared and did a study that identified uh, a number of um, demonstrated or potential uses of sargassum. And these vary from agriculture to food and beverage, renewable energy, biofuels, and you will be hearing about the energy um, potential um, in, in a few minutes. Um, you'll be hearing about the agriculture uh, use, of, use, of, uh, use as fertilizer from Bruce, who will be coming up next, I think. Um, cosmetics and pharmaceutical, paper, bioplastics, construction material, water and air filter, environmental remediation. So there are a number of potential uses of um, sargassum that um, uh, 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 we, can, we, can, we can explore and that are being explored as we, as we move along. Uh, in the next slide, I'm mentioning one here, which is using sargassum to combat climate change and ocean acidification. The, 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 the important thing is this. The sargassum, it absorbs carbon dioxide gas from the, um, from, the, from the ocean surface water, and it can therefore function as a carbon sink. Um, the the, the sargassum can be collected from the coastal water in theory, transported to deeper water, and then sunk into the deep ocean. Uh, once it gets below 100 to 150 to 200 meters, the swim bladder that keeps it afloat in the surface water will collapse and it will, and, and it will sink to the deep oceans. In the deep oceans, it can stay on the bottom of the deep ocean uh, for hundreds or thousands of years, according to the expert, uh, and um, will, will actually sequester the, uh, the carbon in the deep water. And that is actually what happens in nature. <laughs> So, you know, the masses of sargassum in the Atlantic Ocean will eventually um, die and sink to the bottom, taking the, 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 um, the carbon that it accumulates. Now, the, 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 it, it, it has a very high affinity for absorbing uh, the, the carbon. So it sequesters quite a lot of um, carbon. And the value of this, it reduces the greenhouse gases <laughs> um, that is released you know, from whatever sources. So it is actually a very good um, uh, method of carbon sequestration. And this can be beneficial because, you know, uh, it can generate carbon credit for our countries if we are uh, willing to harvest and take it out in the deep sea. You can claim uh, a carbon credit. That is, you know, growing, growing market. So the private sector should have an interest um, 
in doing this. And uh, carbon credits can uh, generate income, can generate um, employment opportunities and livelihoods for our people. So um, that, is, that, is, that is very, very um, uh, important. So now um, in the next presentation, you're going to hear a little more about our collaboration um, uh, with colleagues from New Zealand and using the sargassum in a safe manner to develop um, products, particularly um, fertilizer and compost, and possibly also um, building material. So with the knowledge that we now have, we you know, can, can design um, processes and products that are safe to use um, for people. So thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Hutton. Um, I will invite Dr. Bruce Hill, Crop Physiology Team Leader from the New Zealand Institute for Plant and Food Research Limited to share his screen. And um, he will be um, following on from Milton, having, Milton having uh, made a linkage to discuss innovation and technologies for the safe and total use of sargassum and biomass to bolster Caribbean agribusiness. So, Ms. Dr. Bruce, Seal. Thank you very much. I hope uh, you can all hear me. Um, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be involved in this uh, seminar series and to um, talk about this. Um, I was um, hoping to be able to join you in person, but a series of unfortunate events mean that I have to join you uh, virtually uh, in this way. But um, I wanted to talk to you about this project that we're doing and just touch base um, with, in a high-level view on um, some approaches to developing technologies uh, for the safe and total use of um, sargassum biomass to bolster Caribbean agribusinesses. Um, now, you may not uh, be aware of um, who Plant and Food is. Um, Plant and Food is a government-owned research institute. Our focus really is on developing sustainable production systems, and you can see our, our research themes are geared towards that. One of the, um, a simple way to look at it is that if you can fish it, if you can grow it, if you can process it, store it, if you can turn it into food or drink, uh, then we are involved in research all along that production chain. And one of the things that doesn't show up here is that um, in that research, we are very uh, tightly aligned and um, collaborating with uh, businesses, industries to turn um, science that's done in the lab or the field into something that's practical, applicable, that provides economic and sustainable benefits. And um, as well as doing work in New Zealand, uh, Plant and Food does work um, in different parts of the world. And this is one of these projects that we're involved in. Um, that's already been referred to. So, so I guess some products for climate resilience in the Caribbean. And it's funded by the New Zealand government. Uh, and it's got quite a wide range of uh, partners and collaborators within the region. Uh, so what is this project really looking to do? It's really about um, mitigating the effect of um, uh, the sargassum seaweed, mitigating the environmental effects and the economic impacts that it has within the region. Now, there are three phases uh, to this project. The first phase is really finding out what was in the, um, in the sargassum, uh, what's, what's going on inside that, and that there was an interest and a question around the heavy metals, obviously. And then once we knew that, the second phase is, well, then what can we do with this sargassum? Um, and what products should we um, start to focus on? And uh, how, what is going to need to be involved in, in developing them? And um, taking them not just from um, what's happening in a lab, but also through to market. So there's a commercialization uh, side to this. And then there is um, developing that. So that's the third phase which is um, the outreach and developing of the supply chain. So in terms of um, the first phase, we collected samples from these countries. Um, we wanted to follow, uh, collect samples following the, um, the sargass, different sargassum currents. Um, and basically, uh, the short answer of that is that there is heavy metals in these, uh, in the sargassum. The sarg the heavy metal content is not consistent with season 
or with location of sampling. So um, that means that wherever you sample sargassum, wherever you're harvesting sargassum for a product, you will um, always have a variation in what the heavy metal is. Um, and so that means that uh, any product you develop, you want to take into account the fact that you might have a very high level and treat it from that basis on. And then uh, we had this two-stage uh, product evaluation. And so firstly, there was um, what products can we have a look at? And um, Milton's already referred to some of these. We had 23 products that we uh, looked at. There was pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, uh, plastics, um, biofuels, uh, turning it into functional foods, um, purification material, a whole bunch of things. And they were put through a, a, a grid to evaluate them. That grid um, involved issues around technological complexity for each of these uh, processes, uh, market competition around um, the, the, the development side of that, uh, and also regulation. The regulation associated with um, some of the um, um, more negative compounds, shall we say, that are present in the sargassum, like the heavy metals, um, and, the, and the regulations that apply to them in those different industries. So, for instance, pharmaceuticals and cosmetics. From that, we then shortlisted down to um, soil, what we've called soil production enhancers, which are things like fertilizers, um, compost, and also sustainable building materials. But keeping in mind that we wanted to be uh, having a, um, a total use of the sargassum. And so if you think about this, we harvest the sargassum, we put it through a process uh, where you create the extracts for developing the fertilizers and conditioners. And then you have um, sargassum biomass that has been depleted from, by some nutrients. And then what do you do with it? So that, that is where the opportunity to maybe develop compost comes in and also the opportunity to maybe um, uh, create um, building material. So... That's the setup that we're uh, looking at. Now, in terms of where we're going and where we're at, we have started um, the product development stage and we've done the trials to develop the extracts. And this was done uh, at UE Barbados. And what we've done here is we've used different enzymes uh, to try and create the extracts from the sargassum. Um, and um, that's been um, somewhat successful in the fact that the extracts have re relatively high levels of the plant nutrients, so nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and so on, relatively high levels of that, but it hasn't extracted across a lot of the heavy metals. So the heavy metal is lower and the nutrients are higher than um, we would ex have expected, so that's good. The next stage is how do these things work? And so we've started glasshouse trials, and this is Cardi Barbados doing the glasshouse trials to evaluate these extracts. What we're interested in is how those extracts affect the growth of the crop, its yield, the quality of the product that's uh, there. We want to understand a little bit about how the nutrients are working in the system, but we also want to know how the heavy metal is moving throughout that system. So is it getting accumulated in the plant, in the soil? and um, what are the issues associated with that. As we do this trial, it'll feed back into the extract phase so that we can fine tune what is the best uh, extract method so that you can optimize production and minimize risk. So that's where we're going. And so that then once we've got that, then the next step is um, pilot scale production. And essentially that is that we need um, a large enough uh, production so that uh, we can do the next step, which is field trials. We need enough extract uh, to be able to do that. But then um, along with that, uh, we are doing a survey of farmer fertilizer use at the moment. Um, and that is to understand how farmers um, think about fertilizer, make decisions about fertilizer, use fertilizer, how they perceive the risk of using sargassum fertilizer within the system. Together with information from the field trials, that then feeds into the, um, the outreach and development side. 
As well in the field trials, we want to understand a lot more around the movement of um, heavy metals within the system because we want to do some risk analysis and some modelling um, associated with that. Um, also um, ongoing is um, the compost assessment. So we have um, biomass, but um, how do you turn that into compost? What do you, what other biological product do you mix it with? What happens to the way that um, arsenic in particular is um, partitioned either into organic or inorganic forms? Because that also will dictate the usefulness of um, the compost. And we're also doing the uh, building material evaluation. All along this um, process is this commercialization strategy, which um, helps create um, the, um, the uh, development and the use and the, um, and the implementation of this within the outreach stage. And that is a high level overview of um, this project and what's going on in, um, with this uh, bit of work. Thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. I just want to finish off by highlighting that I'm a very small part of a very large team of people who are involved in this project and without whom um, nothing would be happening. And so um, they deserve that recognition and credit. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Searle. Very interesting presentation. And uh, in the interest of time, I will ask Dr. Devon Gardner head of the technical programs for the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency to um, um, start his presentation on the opportunities and challenges for generating renewable energy from Sargassum. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Madam Moderator. Um, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, really appreciative of the opportunity um, to be able to share uh, this um, event with you and this presentation as part of this event. Um, the, 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 I would like to offer my congratulations to the um, CR, CFRM and its um, partners um, who have um, taken the opportunity to, um, to, 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 de to develop the series, which is very important in you know, our understanding of um, the role of sargassum in terms of its impacts and the potential opportunities and options to be able to uh, manage and extract value uh, from this uh, resource, whether it's you know, a, a resource that have come to us um, as a nuisance and from which we may be able to gain fortuitously, it's left to be seen. Um, I am from the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, which we call the CRE. It's an institution of CARICOM um, established in 2018 um, after the ratification of the agreement that was adopted by heads of governments in 2017 happened. And um, we are supporting member states in CARICOM as a specialized energy agency, similar to what the CRFM does in the fisheries um, industry um, with um, matters related to sustainable energy development and deployment. And um, that's um, what I'll be talking about today. Pretty much um, where are there the opportunities for um, sustainable energy youth development um, from Sargassum? And so I have outlined it in, uh, by looking at five um, areas. I will keep you on track by kind of highlighting where I am as I move through the presentation. So you'll see um, what it is. Milton spent quite a bit of time speaking to the genesis of the issue and what some of the impacts are and um, not just um, fisheries and fish, fish and folks, but also in general and our societies, including the impacts on um, coastal residents and citizens and tourism industries and other industries that are um, coastal and marine dependent. So I, won't, I don't need to spend too much time um, highlighting the problem because of um, the great job that Milton did in his um, scene setting of you know, what some of those issues are that we are trying to solve when we talk about seeking to manage and utilize sargassum in ways that um, allows us to abate the, 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 the blooming, um, uh, as it is referred to by many. Um, it is, of course, I, I agree that sargassum has become one of the most significant threats, as you would have heard, to the integrity of the marine ecosystem. And um, as Milton and others have pointed out, this has been happening since um, 2011 to a large part that is due to excesses um, in the growth and the blooming uh, that happens mostly over the spring and summer months. And um, Milton showed the same diagram, so I will move from there and speak more toward where some of the opportunities are. And the opportunities 
to understand the opportunities, it's important for us to really uh, look at um, what the uh, what 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 the, what the, 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 the structure of the of the sargassum is because if you're talking about um transformation of sargassum into energy then it means that you're going to be looking at some kind of mo molecular recombination you're going to be looking at some chemical um processes that are going to transform uh or convert what you have in terms of the chemical and molecular structure of the sargassum into um, new chemical um, structures um so it's always important for us to understand the biochemical features of the sargassum and so in a, in a sense the, we have um, the understanding is that there are two main um, species, um, of course, two of which are variants of a single species, the Natans and the uh, and, and the Florence, which are um, within the Caribbean itself, and um, and so within that context, we, we we seek to identify how these specific types, because there are a range of different um, species that that that, that, are, that are classified as sargas. I mean, it, you know, but there are all these main ones that are found within the context of the Caribbean, and it's important to understand that. Um, so, so Milton's uh, and and also the, the, the colleague before me spoke about the fact that um, there are interests and um, there have been examples and of course some work that has been done to look at how you can valorize um, sargassum as a feedstock and revamp it into value-added compounds in a number of industries. Um, Agro-industries for biofertilizers is something that. Um, you would you would have heard of, uh, which is something that is frequently touted. And in fact, um, there are quite a number of, um, if you want to call it, entrepreneurship um, uh, activities in Barbados and Antigua and a couple of the countries in Eastern Caribbean that are e experimenting, I would say, uh, with the production of biofertilizers from Saga. So that seems to be the most popular um, interest uh, that has been pursued so far because of the fact that it's relatively, if you want to call it, low process on the one hand. And of course, the nutrient content of sargassum, especially in terms of its metal content, um, is particularly high. And of course, the, some of the, the metals that are necessary for fertilizers like, you know, your, 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 your potassium and your lithium and so on, um, quite a lot of that is available. Um, in Sargassum. Of course, there's cosmeceuticals, pharmaceuticals, and where we will focus today, clean bioenergy um, is, is one of the things. The question we, of course, are looking at, I've been looking at for a while, and this is work that I had started since the days when I was the head of the energy unit at the CARICOM Secretariat. Uh, we started looking at, you know, whether we can cost effectively convert Sargassum into, into, into green biofuels. Um, you know, there are usually three options that we look at in terms of streams when we talk about biofuels. We usually look at biogas, which usually would come uh, from a process which is called biodigestion. Um, and of course, we tend to look at bioethanol, which comes from fer biofermentation. And we look at biodiesel, which usually comes from a process we call transesterification. Those are the three most common, and if you want to call it commercially um, advanced or commercially mature ways. There are other ways, such as gasification and uh, pyrolysis type um, processes, which are much more, if you want to call it, them, um, technologically advanced processes, but not as commercially mature um, that are available. But the three processes that we focused on and it was to try more um, uh, commercially mature and, um, and, 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 and if you want to call it more cost effective typically to achieve because of, if you want to call it the lower cost of the technologies and the wider availability of the technologies. Um, so those were the areas we looked at. In principle, um, we sought to understand um, what would be the process of conversion of um, a, a saga, some biomass into these um, bioenergy um, substrates. And uh, we recognized um, throughout the work that was done, and this is consistent with a number of um, papers, research papers that we have seen, including some recent papers in 2021 and 2020, which really looked at um, the state of um, the, the potential for sargassum for bioenergy production within the Caribbean. Uh, the, the, there is consistency among all the authors and all the experts that the conversion of um, sargassum into any kind of biofuel is best done if there is a significant amount of pretreatment. And that pretreatment um, will vary um, depending on a number of things. As um, the previous colleague mentioned, 
one of the challenges with Sargosum is um, there is no predictability in uh, the, 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 the chemical composition. It varies um, from, from time to time and from place to place. And so there's no consistency where you can say this is what Sargosum contains in terms of um, percentage of uh, different chemical substrates in its um, structure. And so typically on a case-by-case -case basis, one has to figure out how to um, uh, get, the, in a sense, neutralize some of those um, elements inside this orgasm and some of those molecules inside this orgasm uh, and some of those features um, that uh, can be challenging for the processing or the conversion processes that are necessary. So in the case of biodiesel, where we are looking at um, uh, fatty acid, um, uh, methyl ester, what we call ester esterification, transesterification. This is something I will talk about. You know, it's really important for us to look at things like acid or base hydrolysis that can release some of the, uh, the, 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 the limited um, fatty oils and lipids that are available in its structure. And then, of course, you're looking at things like uh, biofermentation. There are things that need to be done with use of ionic liquids and so on to ad advance the ability of the uh, enzymes to, uh, to, fer to ferment this uh, agrosome. And likewise, even in the context of anaerobic um, digestion, uh, because of significant um, amounts of um, heavy metals, as this previous speaker spoke about, and large amounts of silica and um, significant amounts of salinity, um, there are pretreatments that are necessary. So, in a sense, what we have for, well, you know, we, what I try to break it down into in terms of trying to understand some of these, um, these opportunities is to really look at what are some of the biochemical items which makes Saga some uh, a good um, feedstock uh, for bioenergy. Um, Sargosum typically uh, is, uh, and as most algae do, and even more than the regular um, algae, um, it has poor lignin content. And what that means is that it's easy to open the cell structure and get in, and, and access the, 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 the molecules, the, the polysaccharides, as we would call them. Uh, that you would need for things like biofermentation to happen. Uh, so that is, it means that is, there is less um, what we call um, uh, um, less, less initiation energy, uh, initial energy that is required to break open uh, uh, the disagasm. And so the energy use um, that is necessary for you to start to catalyze the process is usually less than you would need in many of in, in many other bioenergy processes because the lignin um, structures in a lot of other biomaterial tend to be much stronger and would require you to put more in in order to get back um, what it is that is available inside and more. Um, so the poor lignin content is one of the, 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 the what one could say is the advantages of sargassum in respect to the ability to, to, to convert it into um, biofuels. It is rich in polysaccharides um, and, and hemicellulose, both of which are um, uh, what we call advanced sugars. So because of those advanced sugars, we, you know, the view is that there's a significant amount of biofermentation that could take place um, in, 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 in respect to uh, sargosum. In fact, biofermentation is viewed as one of the major pathways that could be significant um, if there is to be development of a sargosum uh, industry around bioenergy production in the future. And then, of course, there are the parts that speaks to um, the pretreatment, um, as I mentioned before. In, there are some ways you can um, enhance what is available by treating um, the sargos and biomass. And so we can do um, a number of pre-treatment processes that can enhance the ability to, 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 to produce um, uh, biodiesel, bio, um, bioethanol, or biogas from sargassum. We can use mannose or glucose, um, but we can um, enhance the mannose or glucose content uh, through hydrolysis, enzymatic hydrolysis, uh, that will allow for greater yields of course, in the, um, in, 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 in the in the context of uh, a biofermentation, um, there are reports that says that uh, methanol yields from um, sargassum can improve significantly um, through the use of a uh, method of alignate removal with um, alkaline solution. Um, then there are the hydrothermal pretreatments um, that, to a large extent, can be used to manage um, some of the uh, issues that have been affecting the biodegradation of sargas and by the microorganisms uh, that would typically be available in a biogasification process. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, when we are looking at um, the production of biogas uh, for, from um, sargassum, uh, challenges that the, the microbes, um, biodigestion uh, bio, bio is one of those things where you actually have microbes that have to, in a sense, feed on the substrates that are available in a large tank 
um, and when those uh, microorganisms feed on the substrate, um, then that uh, feeding process um, is, is one where in the, the microbes then expel um, what we call biogas or a, a methane type gas. It's, a, it's, really, it's really methane. Biomethane is something we refer to it as. And so um, in the production of that methane from the bio um, from, from the sub, from the, the organic um, uh, microorganisms, um, we get gas production that can be used for fuels um, in that process. But these microorganisms are very sensitive. They are very sensitive to the prevailing conditions. They are very sensitive to things like pH. They are very sensitive uh, to things like uh, salinity and, acid, uh, and, and, and and many other things. Um, Composition, so things like high silica content, things like high salinity, um, low pH, and these things um, tend to um, affect a significant number of microorganisms involved in the biodigestion process. And what that typically will mean is that if you want to um, treat harsh uh, substances that are harsh, like uh, a sargassum that has significant um, um, uh, you know, amounts of silica content and um, salinity, you typically will have to get um, what we call much more robust. Uh, microorganisms because there are a very small amount of microorganisms that are able to handle these extreme conditions and those are typically much more expensive and much more difficult to manage and it makes the process that much more expensive compared to when the process is not as harsh and then of course there are the hydrothermal processes and i preserve processes that can be used as um, pre-treatment also to improve the availability of sugar for biofine fermentation so what we have seen is that there are opportunities um, if it is that we have the line of processes that can take um, advantage of um, how the sargassum is um, structured chemically and biologically. But, uh, but uh, as with all the opportunities, there are, of course, the challenges in terms of how it is that we can uh, maximize those opportunities. It's important for us to understand, but also the challenges in accessing and, and, and benefiting from those opportunities. In respect to conversion efficiency, um, you know, the, 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 again, I mentioned earlier that um, the pretreatment step being, being necessary is something that will add cost uh, and, and time to your process. So that is, a, a, that is, that is a, one of the, 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 the the, um, the, 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 the the cons to the process. Um, and of course, in the, there's a high amount of manitals and other types of um, uh, um, substances in terms of um, undesirable gases, undesirable um, alcohols. And um, I was mentioned too earlier by Milton and the previous colleague, um, also a lot of heavy metals such, um, uh, uh, such as cadmiums and, um, and so on uh, and, and, uh, that are in, 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 in it and sometimes mercury um, that can be poisonous even to the, 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 the microorganisms that are involved in anaerobic digestion. So that can affect your um, conversion efficiency because it, if, if you are um, treating, if you are trying to convert um, in a biodigester, you could end up poisoning at a significantly higher rate your microorganisms, which means you have to continuously replenish and improve, uh, you replenish your microorganisms in order to maintain your conversion efficiency. If you know, and the rate of replenishment can be quite high, and therefore makes the process quite expensive. Um, then, of course, um, the, one of the other things is that the, if you want to do transesterification. Uh, the lipid content that is naturally available um, in sargassum is very low. Um, typically, for transesterification, that usually happens with oil-based products. You know, that you would have heard about palm oil being used for biodiesel and other types of oil, coconut oil, and those kind of things. Oil-rich products are usually important, uh, uh, utilized uh, for transesterification. There have been a move towards use of algae for transesterification because you could actually um, release. Um, lipids that are available in algae and use these for transesterification. Um, sargassum also can, you know, as lipid content, which can be released and used for transesterification, which then can, is a uh, process of converting um, organic substrates into um, biodiesel. So the organic oils are converted into biodiesel uh, through a process which we refer to as transesterification, where it is that you combine these, these fatty acids and esters uh, with a base that then generates um, um, uh, some kind of an ester, ester inside your process. Um, 
and so the conversion of the fatty acids with the um, base, uh, such as um, uh, sodium hydroxide and so on, producing these, um, met these esters, such as methyl esters and whatever other esters um, you choose to produce or design, um, gives you biodiesel. And we find that um, the amount of uh, lipids that you could get in uh, sargosum is not very high. And so typically, the, 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 you would have to do a lot of work in order to extract um, biolipids from um, sargosum if you are to um, do conversion into transistor certification. So the, 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 the mass that is necessary to get significant amounts of uh, volume of uh, biolipids in order to do conversion for true transesterification is um, going to be far too high uh, for the amount of um, conversion that will take place. Um, then, of course, there's the issue of high moisture and ash content. And um, high moisture and ash, ash content tend to affect um, the ability to do things like, uh, if you, like, like, like gasification um, processes. Uh, if you were to do um, thermochemical processes, um, lots of moisture means you're going to really just spend a lot of your energy vaporizing and volatilizing um, water rather than having it um, helping to um, drive the chemistry. And ash, of course, is something that can poison some of your um, your, your, your your enzymes, and is not desirable in the, in, the, in, in 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 your, um, your, your 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 chemicals. And then I spoke earlier about the high level of toxic elements, including cadmium, arsenic, and so on. And then, of course, the salinity is high. There is a lot of unpredictability in the patterns, as you heard before, in terms of the arrival. So it's difficult to plan around it. Um, then, of course, it decomposes rapidly once it gets close to the shore. Um, then uh, there are, as I mentioned about the variability already in terms of the, um, the, 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 the structure, the chemical structure and the composition, and there are no clear, um, if you want to call it, no acceptable strategies that have been agreed on by all experts in terms of how best to harvest and manage. There are views and what works best, but there is no, um, if you want to call it, standardized process that's agreed by all. So the experiences that we have done uh, uh, in terms of our work in the CARICOM space uh, to support some of this is that we have done some work under the GIZ RITA program um, in 2017 uh, 20 to 2018, where we looked to, to, to see what could be done uh, from some small amounts of substrates. There was a biogas lab that was set up at the University of Belize um, compound um, with money from this program. And that, that biogas lab allowed us to take um, small samples of substrates and, um, vol and, 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 and valorize it and to see um, what really ensues in terms of conversion efficiency as well as products. And we were able to determine from the work that we did in 2017 into 2018 that although biogas production can happen, um, significant amount of hydrothermal pretreatment will be required and that it would be best for an anaerobic digestion to be done if it is co-mixed with other types of substrates, which is similar to what Legina and Henry and the colleagues at um, Cavill Campus are doing by looking at mixing it with vinous from um, sugar cane. Um, so that you, in a sense, improve the calorific value of the of, of the substrate. Then there is bioethanol. Um, the view in terms of the analysis that was done in bioethanol production is that um, the hydrolysis works best um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a case where you, you, we, we, we do pretreatment to break down some of those polysaccharides, but it can be done, and um, but it's expensive to do. And in the case of biodiesel, again, the view is that you would have to do significant amount of pretreatment. Uh, the, the, the conclusion that was made is that any sort of um, work that seeks to focus on single target usage of sargassum is often very expensive because, um, you, you know, each, each of the significant amount of pretreatments. And so the view is always that biorefining might be the way to go because what you do is you end up producing a number of um, co-products that um, each one benefit from uh, the, the, the previous steps. Uh, so rather than um, trying to um, produce um, single products that may have significant, uh, if you want to call it, amount of, uh, significant amounts of residues. So if you do, um, you know, multiple um, biorefining processes, you do not end up with significant amounts of residues because each residue from a one step goes into production of other products are in, in, in future steps. And so that is a way to maximize and limit the approach in terms of the expense. And finally, um, you know, the views going forward is that we need to um, find ways and means of improving 
um, you know, the actions and the act as and 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 and, and coordinate more around um, what we know. And um, so I got some, there's a lot more work that we need to do on forecasting in terms of distribution and, um, and, and, and arrival of the biomass. Yes, much has been done with remote sensing. We have seen a lot of satellite imagery that have been used to aggregate and, and make calculations and forecast. But there's still a lot more that needs to be done. This is probably the area that um, so far is the most advanced, in fact. Um, and, and even then, it still hasn't reached where it's supposed to go. The areas um, thereafter going further to the right are even less. Um, advanced in terms of we still do not understand a lot around the how um, to stabilize and uh, harvest, collect and, uh, and stabilize the feedstock and uh, manage the feedstock. And in any type of investment for conversion, being able to collect and, uh, and manage uh, the logistics chain for your feedstock so that you can um, suitably and efficiently and effectively supply your, you know, convert it with the technologies in which you would have invested is going to be critical. And if this can be done in a way that is predictable, it's always going to be important to predict the economics. And the strategy for exploitation and mitigation, therefore, requires effective management and effective coordination. And this is something that I think that uh, we could work on coming out of this uh, event. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I look forward to the conversations. Thank you very much, Dr. Gardner. And I invite quickly uh, Mr. Joshua Ford, founder and CEO of Red Diamond Compost Inc. from Barbados, to talk about his experience in converting sargassum to plant tonic and treatments. Doc, uh, Mr. Ford. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Um, just to, to jump in pretty quickly with Red Diamond's experience and um, forgive me not having a presentation in place today a bit under the weather. But nonetheless, um, as mentioned, I'm Joshua Port, the founder and CEO of Red Diamond Compost Inc. Uh, based in Barbados. We are a biotech social enterprise focused on creating clean and green agrochemical solutions, um, primarily from different types of organic waste and regenerative sources. I've been working with sargassum seaweed specifically since 2014, um, when we had those early or uh, large influxes um, starting to come into Barbados. And at that time, the idea was essentially just how can we start experimenting with creating, whether it's a fertilizer, plant tonic, um, some type of um, nutrient source for plants from the sargassum. And most of the research at that time um, on sargassum was very, very uh, immature, more or less. We kind of scoured for as, you know, whatever information we could find um, from not only the specific species of sargassum that we were dealing with within the region, but any other research that was done on any other species of sargassum to see what we could learn from what had been done by, by other researchers from around the world. So amazing, to our surprise, really, we were able to find uh, a few bits of information to kind of give us some indication that there was you know, some value in the sargassum as it pertained to its use for agriculture, for crop production. And that's where things started uh, for us, where my focus was on how do we not just create this uh, uh, plant tonic um, or by a stimulant, but how do we do it in a way that's sustainable? How do we do it in a way that's clean? Um, with us and the products that we create, we refrain from using any type of synthetic inputs, um, whether that is any end product or even through the manufacturing processes and try to use as much plant-based uh, sources or plant-derived ingredients and inputs in our products. So from the initial experimentation that I would have done back in 2014 into 2015, we would have seen some indications in the plant tonic solution that was, the, was extracted, being able to have significant effects on root development. So we did some seedling trials, germination trials, and we're just assessing what effect, if any, was the um, extract that we had done uh, having on the different types of seedlings. 
one of the more significant um, results we had at that particular time would have been on some peanut seedlings. And those explosive results that we got in seeing uh, huge, huge meristem activity, um, which was more, you know, more significant than you would normally see, gave the indicator that, well, there was something in the sargassum, there was something special about it that we needed to focus on and, and you know, could potentially develop a commercial product out of. So from there, our research kind of continued along the path of focusing on extraction of uh, plant growth hormones, naturally occurring plant growth hormones that uh, previous researchers would have identified the sargassum containing. And ever since then, we have done a series of um, anecdotal trials continuing to see what type of responses we would be getting, um, various types of crops from fruits and um, fruit trees, um, uh, root crops, um, and, um, and leafy green vegetables as well. And we once, once we got to a point where we were able to create enough of uh, a product sample, I would say that we were considering starting to have farmers um, who would be interested try the product and give us their feedback on it. We started to go along that path um, to get their feedback, see what we could learn from them, see what types of changes or tweaks we may need to make, and then go back to the, the, the drawing board and reformulate our product. So with that, we were able to get some really decent results and really decent feedback in the very early stages of developing our solution at the time, uh, which we call the um, super seaweed, the super seaweed plant tonic actually. And we then decided to move to the next stage seeking you know, further understanding of how the product was actually working and functioning and reached out to Professor Lopez at the time at UWI Cayfield campus to see what he could learn from the product and you know, what he could report back to us. They had done an initial trial um, on it with sweet pepper uh, seedlings at the time, germination. And from that, we were able to learn in using our plant on it in comparison to traditional fertilizer, traditional synthetic fertilizer, and seeking to compare it to the fertilizer application and then cutting the fertilizer application in half and adding the biostimulant as well to see how those would compare. We actually got initial better results from the uh, plant tonic by itself, and then even better results with the synthetic fertilizer application reduced by half plus the, the plant tonic. Um, at this time, it was still very early in terms of how much we really knew about the product in terms of um, not having done certain types of analysis as yet. Um, though having in mind, as, as you would have heard uh, earlier about the uh, sargassum's natural ability to pull all different types of nutrients, including heavy metals from the ocean, um, we always saw it important to take certain precautions in terms of handling the sargassum and even in terms of the process that we use in those er very early stages. Um, just for those considerations until we had the means to be able to test them. But time and time again, we, keep, we kept getting um, that positive, um, those positive results, those positive indicators that there was something special about sargassum and its um, ability to improve uh, crop, produc crop production specifically. And even some of what um, Professor Lopez had mentioned to me at that time, uh, 
indicated that there was even some interaction as it pertains to the microorganisms in the soil and being able to improve soil health. So this kind of you know, motivated and inspired us to continue to keep working, to keep um, refining our processes and continue testing and, you know, going through that whole cycle over and over again until we were able to get to a point where we had a process and a product that could be what we would call commercially viable. Because creating a product that, you know, is again, doesn't contain, uh, you know, a lot of synthetic um, compounds. You, you know, you could imagine comes with, a, you know, new range of complexities of how do you make this something that can be shelf stable, something that can be commercially viable, and you know, go from the production process, getting it into the hands of the end user, and then being able to use it and have success. So. Fast forwarding to now 2000 and I think it's 2020, 21, 22. Um, we were able, thanks to uh, Export Barbados and the Bloom Clean Tech Cluster, which we're part of, to be able to get the funding necessary to take what we have developed at this time and refine out as figuring out all the different bits and pieces of how do we uh, how do we create this commercially viable and clean product from Sargassum and to be able to get our testing done, get our analysis done to be able to, you know, prove and, and, and validate the efficacy of the product and prove the safety of the product at the same time. So we were able to run the chemical analysis on our product and um, gladly see that, you know, we did not have any dangerous or elevated levels of heavy metals present in the end product, which was what we expected, what we were hoping for. And, and thankfully, that's, that's what it resulted. And then we were able to, to start doing uh, some trials overseas. We conducted a turf trial um, looking at the efficacy of the product again on turf, comparing the biostimulant now at this point um, from the sargassum to synthetic fertilizers ap applied, on, you know, through replicated trial on turf to see how does that um, compare, how do those applications compare to synthetic fertilizer um, to be able to get, you know, the type of quality turf that you would want for sports fields, for events, you know, whether that is golf or polo or whatever the case is. And we were able to, we were able to um, have the optimal green achieved from one of the two application rates that we uh, would have done for that particular trial with the biostimulant by itself. And then similarly to that, the, the trial we did at the university, we did, um, a reduced synthetic application, cut it by 50% and added the biostimulant as well. And that um, actually led us to having a, a level that was even, you know, deeper green than would be optimal, say for turf, which was something even new to us. Um, but looking at the score sheet for the, the, the turf industry, um, we were able to even surpass that, which, you know, is potentially indicating that we could reduce the levels even lower for both even the fertilizer, but also the biostimulant application to the turf to be able to achieve that. And at no point throughout it did we see any sort of phytotoxicity as well from the turf. Um, and from the assessment of that particular trial in terms of the nutrient analysis of the soil, we saw that we saw some indicators that the utilization of certain nutrients seemed to have been higher in the biostimulant applications compared to the ones that didn't have the, the biostimulant in it. 
So this was another um, significant uh, milestone for us that, uh, well, it answered a lot for us. It obviously created a whole host of other questions um, that, that we needed to answer. So from there, we were, we decided to conduct an analysis, DNA sequence analysis, to better understand the microbial component or the microbial potential um, of the biostimulant we have developed and to better understand what effect that can have not only on the plants directly, but also specifically on the soil and the soil health and the, the beneficial biodiversity of the soil and the potential impact that the product can have on that. And we saw some very, very exciting results for us, which indicated um, having the ability of our biostimulant to improve the nutrient efficiency and nutrient cycling um, and nutrient mobilization even of several nutrients from nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, going down through to um, you know, elements like copper, um, you know, manganese and so on, all these different important nutrients and elements. Um, in addition to uh, being able to produce different types of enzymes to reduce plant stresses, to actually even reduce the, the stresses and toxicity that could be caused by heavy metals as well. Um, these were some of the indicators that we saw from this type of um, the DNA sequence analysis on the product. And from there, what we're going to be moving to do are some more field trials and actually do DNA sequence analysis of those trials where we do those applications and continue to compare that going forward. Um, what we were able to do most recently, well, uh, probably that was about a month ago to complete as well, um, was our Spain trial where we conducted assessment of the biostimulant along with one of our other flagship products and a series of international products in the seaweed and biostimulant space. Um, and the trial was conducted on plum tomatoes and cucumbers. And we were really happy with the, the results of the trial. I have not been able to fully um, compile the notes on, on it, but we were extremely happy to see that our products were performing just as good as the international products and some products that even um, say listed added, added nutrients and added inputs, you know, added nutritional inputs um, to them and not, you know, say just a, a seaweed extract. And in many instances, our products even outperformed them in, in terms of the yield um, for those particular crops. Again, seeing no sort of negative impact in terms of the uh, phytotoxicity, um, any plants, no sort of um, you know, particularly damage, fruit, fruit damage or anything like that. And yes, producing very, very good um, yield, very good uh, market standard uh, crops for both the uh, tomato and the cucumber. But I think what one of the things that stood out is that we definitely are going to be dialing in a lot more on doing uh, you know, those crop by crop trials and analysis going forward to better understand how we can optimize our application rates to the most optimal levels um, for both the, the uh, different crops that we're going to be dealing with from the fruit and crops and so on. So for going forward, we see a very uh, promising future, I would say, with sargassum, with the biostimulant products um, that we uh, have developed and again we're continuing to kind of optimize how uh, the work that we do in terms of the uh, specific crops that we're going to be testing and uh, analyzing and 
really focusing and dialing in on those application rates and the effect that we're gonna ultimately have on soil health, not only in the short term, but the long term going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fort. And uh, I would just like to ask the panelists, uh, before we move on to the next speaker, there are a number of questions in the chat. So for those of panelists who can answer the questions in the chat, it would help us out because we, do, we are behind time. There are some specific questions to sit in panelists, and if they can address it, we would be very happy. At this point, I would like to introduce Mr. Lynch Frevrier, Senior Technical Specialist the Agricultural Sector OES Commission to speak on the OES Sargassum journey in advancing value chain development. Mr. Frevrier. Thank you very much. Um, be before I begin, um, let me just um, uh, make a comment. And um, from the point of view of the, of the OECS Commission, um, our objective in, 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 in looking at Sargassum is to see what has been done out there and to, develop and to propose or advance um, sustainable and economically viable um, solutions um, that will assist the removal of sargassum from the beaches, um, 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 from the waterfront, from the communities, especially the eastern coast of the, of, of the UCS countries. Um, but based on the conversation that, that I've, I've, I've been listening to, um, from the from the past presenters, um, I'm, I'm I am noting that that there may be some work. We we, we are still at, at the the stage where there's a lot of work that has to be done, both scientifically and analytically, and um, and I think it would be a, a, a challenge moving forward um, um, to be able to make it to to come to the point where. Um, the uses and the processes um, um, after seaweed is extracted or removed um, from, from our, our seafront, from, from our beaches, is at the point where it is sustainable and economically viable. And I think, um, in my opinion, from the point of view of the OECS, because um, we're not scientists, but we, um, we're looking at it from the point of view of economics, um, what processes, what, what investments um, that, we can, that we can guide uh, and um, encourage um, um, the, 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 um, the, the, the nationals in country or even projects at the regional level that will advance um, certain actions that are sustainable and economically viable. And um, to be brutally honest, uh, as I sit here, I, I, I have a lot of questions. Um, I, am, I am seeing that a lot of, of the, the initiatives, especially the use in, in the agriculture sector, um, still have a lot of questions um, for that. Okay, so um, with regards to, to having a, a, an, an overview of, of what we're doing, I, I will not um, reinvent the wheel, but the context um, um, that, that we at the OECS Commission have and our concern would be the potential impact on the agriculture sector that was well ventilated in terms of um, um, the downstream impact of what would the heavy metals do um, um, on, on in terms of accumulation in the agriculture sector on, uh, on the soil, um, in terms of its accumulation in the end product, which is the commodities which end, end up in, in the supermarket shelves. Also, the, uh, the potential for, um, for contaminant um, of the of, of of the farmers and, and and the people who use it and 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 and, and one thing I, I do notice that um, the removal of of, of sargassum from beaches and then taking it to another um, place to dump and, and so that the, the tourists can recreate on the beach is not solving this, is not solving the problem so therefore there's a, there's a sick there's an imperative there's a need there's an urgent need to um to 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 economically and sustainably use the product because that is that is the only solution, the long-term solution for the use of the product. And I think that has to be recognized and, 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 and it's quite urgent. And I, and I personally believe that um, we may not think of it as a, 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 as a crisis, but I think um, 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 there is an urgent and, and there's a crisis in, in terms of the sargassum um, washing up on our beaches and, and impacting our coastal, our coastal and even national livelihoods, and, 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 and I think there should be renewed and urgent effort um, to, 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 to find solutions, um, to, 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 to be able to take off the, the sargassum, 
from the beaches and from the coastal seafront and, 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 and effectively sequester it or use it or remove and, and make it less impactful on the environment. So therefore, um, um, the previous speakers had mentioned the impact on the tourism sector, the impact on the fisheries sector um, that was well ventilated, um, impact on the coastal communities which, which in terms of access, health, and 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 the scent. Okay, so so what is the OECS, the OECS is doing? Um, we are, are focusing on on a, on a portfolio of, of blue economy um, value chains, and um, we we are actually looking at conch, um, sargassum, um, sea moss, and fish. And um, we, with regards to the to the sargassum project um, and and and, and sea moss. Uh, we are onboarding a project um, in collaboration with the Carbon Biodiversity Fund, which is valued at 600,000 euros. And it will be, we'll be looking at value chain work um, in CMOS, um, Sargassum, and of course, um, continuing some work that we did with the Kong, um, with the Kong value chain that we, where we collaborated with UNCTAD and CITES. Um, we'll be seeking um, to probably est to establish a Kong nursery um, pilot nursery on Union Island in SVG, um, and we are advancing on that. However, um, with regards to 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 to, to Sargassum, the, the 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 intention really is to is 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 to look at what's happening um, 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 with Sargassum, and to to determine. Um, what would be the, like I mentioned earlier, the economic and, and, and sustainable use of it? Um, we're not, um, we, there's no intention for the OECS Commission to, re to reinvent the wheel. Um, we are looking at, um, as we speak, um, onboarding a consultant who for the next um, year is going to do a high level assessment of what is being done in the sargassum um, um, value chain with regards to sargassum uses um, was, um, throughout the region and even internationally. And um, like I said earlier on um, in, in my introduction, my, um, my concern is to find um, actions or initiatives that are sustainable and economically viable. Because at the end of the day, um, even if um, you have a project to, in, to, to introduce or, or encourage stakeholders to, to participate in an action or, or improve their, their efficiency in a particular um, activity. It has to be sustainable in the long run. And, and, in, and in this regard, I, th um, I, I have a, a, a few questions and concerns with regards to the, to the, to the work that has already been done in terms of um, looking at this, um, this, this sargassum and then determining what is, 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 um, is safe and, and therefore what can go into the, uh, in, in the, in, in the space of, of, of economic development and, and, and efficiency. Um, I've listened um, to a lot of the presentation and, and a lot of it is, is, is research-based and, and I think a lot of it is at the, at, at the point, um, have not gotten to the point and I'm hoping I'm wrong, uh, and, and our assessment will, will, will tell us that, um, that we can move forward in terms of, of, of encouraging uh, and working with, with other partners to, collaborate, to, in, to encourage collaborative action and investment in the agriculture sector. I think that is where we need to get to, to solve the problem in the medium to long term, where, where, um, where the, the private sector um, will be able to confidently and if, uh, um, um, invest and, 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 and in, in the agriculture, in, this, in the sector, in, in sargassum uh, um, use. Um, with regards to, the, to, this, to, this, to this project, um, um, it is an initial one-year work plan. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we, um, we are actually onboarding the consultant and I also mentioned that, that, that really and truly, um, we're, not, we're not going to be reinventing the wheel. Um, we'll be simply seeking collaboration um, and in, engaging all the, all the actors um, in, in this space um, to, to do a high-level analysis of what is done, what's happening, and then, but not only high-level, but, but realistic. And like, like I indicated to you, the, the underpinning criteria, it has to be sustainable. It has to be economically viable. 
Um, and not only that, it has to be um, from the point of view of the of the stakeholders, um, in particular the, um, the 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 rural coastal communities, the um, the rural the rural, the rural people who the fishers and um, people that you, that you are asking to to invest into that uh, or to buy or to buy into your your solution. It has to be realistic for them, and it has to be um, of 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 the right. It must be my right scope. It must be scalable. Um, so therefore, um, we'll be looking um, to put together, uh, the output would be a plan of action with identified priorities. And, and it's just, and it's not just identified priorities. It has to be, um, and it, it, all, it all comes back to, to that. Um, it doesn't matter what you can do, whatever project you deliver, but it has to be um, suited for um, 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 for the for the stakeholder that that you're targeting and the people you're trying to, to drive the solution. So it mustn't be too high above their head that that they can't reach it. And I think that's the problem that, that we have. So, um, with regards to recommendations on uh, the way forward, I I see significant opportunity here to um, to to um, to develop partnerships and 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 not only to assess the value chain. Um, to see what is being done at the in, in the various um, 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 subsectors, but to develop practical solutions, and 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 I think um, that is where we're going with that. Um, but also, but very very importantly, um, there must be a focus on understanding the needs, um, the needs of, um, and for, and to facilitate development and implementation solution by this, by the stakeholders. Key. So, what are their needs? Um, if you look at, at the, if you go to go, go to the coastal community, um, say in Prale or or, or, or um, Miku in, in Saint Lucia, where where the scent is, is is real bad and the fishermen have to pull the boats with rope to, to come in and go out, we have to determine what are their needs because very untruly it, it, they, they're probably not interested in 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 in, a, in, 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 the, in, in extracting the products from 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 CMOS. They probably Simply in, interested in having to get get the beach cleared so that it can go on with their day to day lives, and 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 these are practical solutions. So therefore, a solution would simply mean how you solve the problem to facilitate um, um, the day to day activities of of, of, of of your target communities, and and I think that that is um, important. So I I would say um, in a nutshell. Um, Moving forward, the focus really and truly, I think, the, this, the, um, the, the problem is too, is too large for one single person to solve, but would have to be in collaboration. And, um, and therefore, uh, in that regard, I would welcome collaboration and conversations with other agencies as, as to moving and, and advancing and, and seeking solutions for this very, very um, important problem that impacts the livelihoods of, of our of our coastal communities and and, and our countries. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ferrier, and thank you to all these speakers this morning. We had very interesting conversation and a wealth of knowledge that was imparted. So at this point, we were supposed to have uh, some questions and answers. Unfortunately, we are very much out of time. So um, we have addressed most of the questions in the chat. So I would probably want to give the opportunity to the persons here present at, in, in, ba in the Bahamas for one question, if there's any question. Yes, sure. Madam moderator, my name is Pericles Malus, farmer and other things. Um, I came to learn and I learned a lot but I'm also depressed and confused. So is there an interim verdict on how toxic sargassum is? Because we take it off the beach and we pile it around our coconut trees. And we, make, we, we put it down and cover it with soil and plant sweet potatoes with great success. In the old days, people m made a, a, a circular frame filled it with sargassum. We're talking about the chamber pot days, and the chamber pot, maybe that's the biostimulant, would go in, and they planted the tomatoes on the outside, and they were fantastic. Um, are we to stop doing that, or can we continue 
small practical uses as has been going on. When you put one on, on our sterile beach ridges that have very little nutrients, when you put a coconut tree, it takes a long time to move, but if you keep piling seaweed around it, it grows. Are we poisoning ourselves? I need some kind of guidance. Um, Well, if I, if I may offer a comment on that one. Um, I think we need to be concerned. Um, the studies have been done and show that um, plants, uh, vegetables in particular, um, that have been fertilized with um, sargassum uh, have picked up some of the heavy metals in the plants. And so um, it can be transferred uh, to people. Um, now, the heavy metal becomes a problem because they accumulate and the impact is not usually immediate. It can take years before these things accumulate in uh, the animal's body and in people's body before it starts you know, affecting you. But so, so, so uh, I know people have been using sargassum from a long time. I remember 20, 30 years ago, um, I was told that it's a good fertilizer because we use, every year we always get small quantities and we use it. And using it in that small quantity may really not be a problem because uh, even if you introduce um, uh, uh, the heavy metals, remember, first of all, we have these heavy metals in our soil already <laughs> and the, the concentration vary. Um, you may add a little more, and you may still be below the overall threshold because you're not adding a lot. The problem is, if you continue doing that over a long time, you're going to exceed that safe threshold. Now, I say this uh, um, not as an expert, and I really believe that going forward, our uh, experts in environmental health and public health need to be engaged in this discussion and come up with safe guidelines for um, uses. So in my opinion, one of the challenges going forward in dealing with sargassum is to have uh, a, a, a regulatory framework developed that set the standards and so on for um, safe use of the sargassum for the long term. And it is the long term that, that we have to think about. And, uh, and our children being exposed as we are now to sargassum on a continuing basis, you know, compared to uh, 20 years ago, it's very different. You know, d during certain times of the year, we usually get small quantities. Most people wouldn't come in contact and be uh, interacting with it. But now it's different. You know, we have almost continuous um, sargassum in our water. So, so my, 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 our suggestion and the position we have adopted in the project that is funded by the government of New Zealand is a very precautionary approach. We talked about the precautionary approach um, yesterday. So it's better to be safe than to be sorry. And, you know, we are, and most of us are still in experimental uh, stages. And what we're doing is testing, testing, testing. It's very expensive because we don't even have the capacity to test uh, quickly um, anyway, in the Caribbean region. So we have to be sending samples to different labs in the United States, and it's expensive, you know, to be testing when we collect, testing when we um, prepare the, uh, the, the liquid fertilizer, testing when we apply it, testing the soil so that we know what is in the soil and what may be added, you know, and testing the plants and so on. So a lot of testing, and, and we're doing that because of the concerns about the safety. But, but I think um, it's clear um, there are risks. It's clear that um, these are manageable. I mean, cocoa, uh, as, as you know, um, uh, there's a problem with um, um, uh, arsenic, cadmium, sorry, in, in, in cocoa. But the, the cocoa manufacturers and families, I mean, they found a way to handle it safely. But you have to know what you're doing. And that's the important uh, message. We can use it, but we need to be careful and know what we're doing. Thanks. Thank you so yes. much. Um, unfortunately, at this time, we need to wrap up. We, uh, so I would like to invite um, Dr. Marin Headley, Program Manager of the CRFM, for the, for, to give us the closing remarks and a vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And
and good for everyone. And thanks to our participants who are joining us online and um, in person. On behalf of the CRPM Secretariat, I have the pleasure of also thanking our speakers for sharing their expertise. And as we are all aware, Sargasm has created many challenges and some opportunities for innovation and product development. The CRPM remains committed to working with all of our partners in addressing these challenges, uh, exploring opportunities, building synergies, and strengthening the region's ocean economy. We again express our gratitude to the Government of New Zealand and the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the New Zealand Institute for Plant and Food Research Limited for the technical and financial assistance that they have been providing to the region through the Sargasm Products for Climate Resilience in the Caribbean. And we also acknowledge our contributions from our various, sorry, contributions from our various partners in this project, including Cardi, UWI, Cape Hill, and our consultants. So once again, thank you, and we look forward to finding a viable solution to the sarcasm um, issue and problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye.